Lord, each one of us just long for that touch every day. Healing, calming, making us whole. And Lord, help us understand more and more as we learn what it really means to follow the Lamb. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. We were uh, doing a Revelation Now meeting in a little town was Waynesboro, Virginia. And in small towns, you can afford a lot more advertising because it's not so expensive. So we just saturated. We had hundreds of radio ads and newspaper ads all over the brochures everywhere. And I was listening on the radio trying to see if I could hear some of the advertising. And sure enough, as soon as I turned it on, I heard a man breathing rather heavily. <laughs> And uh, his friend, the other DJ, said, Hey, what's the matter? He said, Man, I'm out of breath. I've been running. What are you running for? Trying to get away from all those dragons and seven-headed beasts running around in the parking lot. <laughs> you know, a lot of people think that that's what Revelation is all about. Dragons and seven-headed beasts. But Revelation is about the Lamb. It's not about the beast. And Revelation is about those who would worship the Lamb. It's a spiritual book filled with spiritual themes. And those who want to hear only about the dragons and the beasts and all of the animals can't understand why do we take the time to talk about the gospel? Why do we take the time to talk about the cross? Why do we take the time to talk about the law and the grace of God and the Lord's day? But when we understand the issues of revelation, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And all of these things teach us who Jesus is, who God is. The Bible begins with the words, Blessed is the one who reads and takes to heart the words of this book. There's a blessing here. And that blessing only comes as we know God and Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is a, is a book about worship. In the 12th, 13th, and 14th chapter, we discovered a conflict. A conflict between those who would worship God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and those who would worship the beast. The Bible tells us we worship God for two reasons. We worship Him because He is the creator. But we find the second reason for worshiping God in the 5th chapter of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, And then I saw a lamb looking as if he had been slain standing in the center of the throne. So here's a lamb, a poor, pitiful, bleeding lamb standing in the center of the throne and the four living creatures and elders all fell down before the throne and they sang in a loud voice, verse 12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth and in the sea, all that is in them singing to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb. We worship God because He is the Creator and we worship God because He is our Redeemer. And it is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that makes life possible. God gave us a memorial, a reminder that would emblaze on our hearts and minds forever if we would just recognize it, that He is the Creator. He carved that monument out of time. 
The seventh day is a reminder, a memorial to the creative power of God. Tonight we're going to see the second monument, the second memorial to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We worship God because He is the Creator, and we worship God because He is our Savior. And we find that in Matthew, the 28th chapter, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, these are the last words of Jesus before He ascended into heaven that Matthew recorded. Usually, a person saves their most important words for the last words. And here, Jesus, His most important words. In verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you and surely I'll be with you always even to the end of the age. Go, Jesus said, teach them all things, make disciples and baptize them. Baptism is mentioned over 80 times in the New Testament. Baptism is so important that Jesus included it among His last words. And yet today there is much confusion about the question of baptism. Many people ask, well, how should a person be baptized? When should a person be baptized? How many times can a person be baptized? Does God recognize all forms of baptism? I want to begin by answering that last question first tonight. Does God recognize all forms of baptism? In the little book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 3, Paul writes, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. How many gods are there? One. How many lords are there? How many faiths are there? How many baptisms are there? One. Now, Paul is not saying that a person can only be baptized one time when he says one baptism. That's not what he's saying. Because we can find examples of Paul himself encountering people who had been baptized, didn't understand what it meant, taught them what it meant fully, and baptized them again. So, no, he's not saying you can only be baptized one time. Most of the time, one time is enough. But there are examples and times when people are baptized and it didn't really mean that much to them and they would like to be baptized again when it's more meaningful. There are times when people are baptized and then go far off the path from what God has in mind for them and when they come back, they choose to be baptized again. I was baptized again. There's nothing wrong with that. Some people get baptized and don't even know it. One man said to me, he said, Pastor, I think I want to be baptized again. And I said, well, why do you think you want to be baptized again? Because I'm not sure if I ever got baptized before. Why not? Well, because I guess I was too little. My mom told me I was. See, baptism is so important that we need to understand what it means. And it's not wrong to be baptized again. But most of the time... It's not, it's not necessary. Most people are baptized and they live their lives following Jesus and they don't need to be baptized again. But the Bible is saying that God only recognizes one form of baptism and that is the only form of baptism that was ever practiced in the Christian church for the first 500 years of existence and that was baptism by immersion underneath the water. In fact, the word baptize means to immerse, to submerge under the water. In fact, the word baptize is not and was not even a religious word. It was a common, ordinary word used by everyone. 
if a person, a lady back in Bible times, wanted to dye a piece of cloth, she would say, I'm going to baptize the cloth in the dye. Because that's what it meant. If you lived in Bible times and you wanted to dunk your donut, you would say, I'm going to baptize my donut. Now, any donut dunker that knows anything about Dunkin' Donuts knows that you don't just sprinkle a drop or two on the donut. You got to put it under the surface, get it good and wet. Amen? That's what it means to dunk a donut. And that's what it means to baptize. You see, the Greek word baptizo was a common, ordinary word. It meant to immerse. And when the Bible translators who were translating the Bible from Greek into English came to that word, baptizo, they should have translated it immerse. Go and immerse them. The problem was they were not baptizing by immersion anymore. And so they couldn't translate the word. So they did what is called a transliteration. Transliteration is simply instead of translating what the word means, they translate the letters. The beta was a B. The alpha is an A. Pi is P. And they got the English word baptize. See, you knew a little Greek and you didn't even realize it. Baptize is a Greek word. It means to bury, to immerse under the surface. That's the meaning of the word. So when Jesus said, go and baptize, he really said, go and immerse, put them under the surface of the water. And we can understand why this is important when we understand the true meaning of baptism. In Romans, the sixth chapter, we find it in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Paul begins by saying, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Now, why did he say that? Obviously, he was answering a question that was being raised at the time. There were people who were actually so upset with Paul's teaching that we're saved by grace through faith and not by works, but it's a gift of God. They were upset with Paul's teaching that no one is saved by keeping the law. They got so upset, they said, well, if that's the case then, if we're saved by grace and not through obeying the law, then why don't we just go on sinning because the more we sin, the more grace we can have. You see, that's how the sinful human mind works. But that isn't how God's mind works. And watch how Paul answers that question. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, he said. Why not? Because we died to sin, so how can we live in it any longer? What do you mean, Paul? We died to sin? What does that mean? And watch how he answers that question. What does it mean to die to sin? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You can't go on sinning. Why not? Because you died to sin. What's that? You were baptized. That's why you can't go on sinning. You were baptized into His death. You were baptized into Christ's death. We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised up from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That's why you can't go on sinning. Of course we're saved by grace through faith. We are not saved by obeying the law. Obeying the commandments of God saves no one. 
But you can't go on sinning because you're saved by grace. Why not? Because you were baptized. And when you're baptized, you die to sin. You were buried into His death. And that's precisely why God can say, like He said to Adam and Eve, if you eat the fruit of the tree, you will die. And like he says to us, the wages of sin is death. If you sin, you're going to die. That's why God can say that and then save us and give us eternal life because we do die in Christ with Him in His death by baptism. We die with Him. We are buried with Him in the water. And just as Jesus was raised up from the dead, we too come up out of the water with Him in order to live a new life for God. That's what baptism means. That's why you can't even think about sinning because you died to sin. You see, we're born sinful, headed for destruction. But the moment you encounter Jesus Christ and repent of your sins and confess your sins, you're born again. And you die to that old life. You are buried in the water with Jesus, just as He was buried in the grave. And you come up out of the water a new person to live a new life of obedience to God. That's what baptism means. That's why it's so important. It is a monument. It is a memorial to the fact that Jesus died on the cross. He was buried in a grave and three days later He was raised up again. And when we're baptized, we enter in to that experience with Him. Now today, practically the entire Christian world observes Sunday in honor of the resurrection of Jesus. But the Bible never says to set aside a day in honor of the resurrection. The Bible says that baptism is the monument, the reminder of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And when we set a day in honor of the resurrection, then we no longer have a day in honor of the Creator and evolution comes into the church. And the devil kills two birds with one stone. Because when we set a day in honor of the resurrection, even though the Bible never says to do it, then baptism loses its meaning. And... Christianity can become watered down and meaningless because we're no longer dying to the old life, being buried with Jesus and rising up again to live a new life. Now, I'm not saying that everyone that is baptized by sprinkling does it because they don't want to die to the old life. Most people aren't even aware of what the Bible teaches about baptism. But once God reveals His will and His plan to us, then I think He expects us to follow it. Amen? And that's the important point. You see, we can rationalize. Men always rationalize. You know what rationalizing is? It's trying to find a loophole, trying to find a way out from doing whatever it is that you're expected to do. It's dangerous to rationalize. When you start rationalizing, how do you know when to stop rationalizing? I think of two young men that were worshiping God. They were both raised and born into the same godly family. They both had the same godly parents. And they were both prepared an altar to worship God. Their names were Cain and Abel. Now, Abel worshiped God exactly the way God said. He said he wanted a lamb, and Abel offered a lamb. Cain rationalized. Abel's a shepherd. I'm a farmer. I don't have lambs. He's got lambs. I got fruit and vegetables. 
But well, I have some fruit and vegetables with juice that looks just like blood. After all, the lamb doesn't save anybody. It's a symbol. And so my symbol can be just as good as his symbol. And he offered the vegetables and God rejected that. He accepted his brothers and Cain became so angry he murdered his own brother. Why? Over the issue of worship. Now you can understand why worship is such an important part of the book of Revelation. People who worship God properly are always despised by the ones who try to rationalize God's Word. It's easy to rationalize. Eve did it. Oh, that apple looked like the other apple. I don't see any difference there. Whatever kind of fruit it was, somebody said to me the other night, oh, where does it say it was an apple? It doesn't say it was an apple. I'm just using that as an illustration. Let's say fruit. God said, don't eat the fruit. Well, that fruit looks like this fruit. Doesn't matter. I'll just not eat this one and eat this one. Rationalize. We know what happened as a result of that. And so people rationalize today. A little bit of water, a lot of water, doesn't matter. It's just a symbol. One day, seventh day, first day, sixth day, what difference does it make? See, so rationalize. I want to tell you that the way I understand the Bible, God means exactly what He says. And I said, do you think He really cares what day? The question isn't the day. The question is, do you trust God? Do you believe God? Just like Eve, it, the real issue wasn't the fruit. The real issue was she didn't believe God. When he said, don't eat from that tree. And so today, God says, this day is the day I make holy. The real issue isn't which day, it's do you believe God means what he says. That's why it's important. Baptism, he says, be immersed. And some say, oh, a drop or two will do. God means what he says. And you start to rationalize, how do you know when to stop? For the first 500 years in the history of the church, they baptized by immersion under the water. But then maybe one day somebody said, ooh, there's too much work in the desert here. Not that much water, get together. Maybe we can just get a bucket and pour it on top. And they start baptizing by pouring, rationalizing. And then one day, a lady was going to be baptized, perhaps, and she said, you know, I just came from the beauty parlor. I got a new hairdo. All that water, hey, it's just a symbol. Little water, a lot of water, doesn't matter. Just sprinkle a drop or two. That's okay. It's a symbol. Makes sense. But not to God. God says, immerse under the water. How do you know when to stop? When you start rationalizing. I read about churches in the Orient. They sprinkle salt on top their heads to baptize. Other churches baptize with a drop of oil on the forehead. I even read about a church in California in Hollywood where a beautiful blonde movie star wanted to be baptized and she thought it would look nice if they sprinkled rose petals on her pretty blonde hair. In that church, they use rose petals. How do you know when to stop when you rationalize God's Word? I read about a pastor on the East Coast whose grandson wanted to be baptized on the West Coast, couldn't afford a plane ticket, so he did it long distance. Baptism by long distance. There are even churches where the people being baptized stand in front of the church and the pastor raises his hand and says, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the dry cleaning method. <laughs> See, the point is, how do you know when to stop when you start tampering and rationalizing with God's symbols. How do you know when to stop? Long time ago, a Native American chief walked into the mission on the frontier, sit in a frontier town. And the Padre was busy there in the mission, and the chief saw a Bible sitting on the table. He said, What's that? The Padre said, that is the Word of God. And the chief said, I want to read that. So the Padre loaned him his Bible. And every night the chief stayed up late reading by the light of the fire. 
the Word of God. Finally, he finished the book all the way through. Went back to the mission. And he told the padre, he said, I want to be baptized. And the padre says, great. No, nothing more exciting than somebody wanting to be baptized. So he turned around and he took a little gold cup out of the cupboard and took some water to put in the cup. And the big chief looked at that gold cup. He said, that's too small. <laughs> Padre says, no, you don't get in the cup. I'm going to just sprinkle a drop or two on your head from the cup. And the chief said, oh, if that's the right baptism, then you gave me the wrong book because he understood that baptism meant to be buried under the water to die to that life of sin to rise up again in order to live a new life for God once you rationalize how do you know where to stop well okay pastor I understand baptism means to immerse to bury under the water but I mean, really, how important is it? What a question. God doesn't say anything that's not important, does He? Every word that comes from His mouth is important. But Peter makes that clear to us in 1 Peter chapter 3, looking at verse, oh, verse 20. <clears throat> Here he's speaking about the flood. You remember the story of the flood? And he speaks about the flood and those who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. Now listen to this. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. Say, Peter, you don't mean that. We're not saved by baptism. We're not saved by doing anything. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. How can you say we're saved by baptism? He answers that. He says at the end of verse 21, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand. No, we're not saved because we're baptized. We are baptized because we're saved through the resurrection of Jesus. See, baptism, the waters of the flood were a symbol of baptism. God used the flood to destroy the old world the way it was, full of sin. And then the flood went down and the earth comes up again, a new earth ready to be inhabited by people willing to obey God. And that symbolizes baptism, dying to the old life of sin, burying in the grave, watery grave, coming up again to live a new life. And that's what saves you. Now how can baptism save you? Through the resurrection of Jesus. Follow me. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. He never sinned. But when he was baptized, John said, I'm not worthy. Jesus said, this must be done in order to fulfill all righteousness. And so Jesus was baptized. Why? In order to fulfill all righteousness. You see, we have sinned. We cannot obey God's commands. And therefore, He sent His Son, Jesus, to come into this world. He kept the commandments. He did everything that we should have done. He was even baptized for us. And when we accept Him, His perfect life stands in our place. Even His baptism stands in our place because your baptism and mine is not good enough. Only the baptism of Jesus was good enough. It's His resurrection that saves us. And that's how the thief on the cross can be saved. He didn't get baptized after he believed. He couldn't get baptized. He was hanging on a cross. But Jesus' baptism stood for Him. It's His baptism that saves you. 
And therefore, when we accept Christ, then we follow and we obey. Noah wasn't saved because he built the ark. He built the ark because he was saved and had faith in God. We're not baptized in order to be saved. We are saved and we're baptized because we are saved. Can we accept the blood of Jesus and reject the waters of baptism and claim to be following the Lamb? Well, okay, I need to be baptized. You convince me. What should I do in order to prepare for baptism? I found three things that I think the Bible points out for us that preparation for baptism. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus said, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Baptism is for believers. There's nothing magic about the water. You can't pick somebody up and throw them in the water and say, now you're baptized, whether you wanted to be or not, now you're saved. No. Baptism is for believers. He who, is, who believes and is baptized is, is going to be saved. We're saved because we believe in Jesus. We're saved by faith and we're baptized as a visible expression of our faith in God. So it doesn't do one bit of good to be baptized if you don't believe in Jesus. Now, there's something else that flows naturally from that. In order to believe in Jesus, a person must be old enough to understand about Jesus. You can't baptize an infant because they don't know how to believe. The Bible says we dedicate infants to God. It's a special service of dedication to God. And then we dedicate them hoping that their parents will raise them and train them to follow the Lamb so that when they're old enough to believe, then they will be baptized too. And then the second thing Jesus said, we already read the verse, we began with it tonight in Matthew 28. He said, teach them to obey all things that I've commanded you. All things. So baptism means that we need to understand what Jesus wants us to do. Before we're baptized, we should understand what it means to follow the Lamb. We should know a little bit about what that life of sin is that we're dying to, and we should understand what the new life is that God wants us to live, and we should be willing to order our lives in harmony with God's plan for us. And then we're ready for baptism. Now, it doesn't mean that we need to be perfect and mature. Baptism is not the graduation service for Christians. It's the enrollment service. So the moment we understand what it means and the moment we repent of our sins and we want to follow Christ, at that moment we're ready to be baptized. And then the third thing that I see in the Bible, on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached a powerful gospel sermon, they came to him and said, what should we do in order to be saved? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. In fact, John the Baptist in Luke, the third chapter, if you look with me in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, John the Baptist went through all the country, in verse 3, all the country around the Jordan River preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So baptism is a demonstration of our repentance for sin. John said in verse 7 to the crowds coming out to be baptized, imagine he makes an altar call and a crowd comes down and says, baptize us, John. Wow, you'd think he would really be excited. Amen? No, not so fast. He said to the crowd in verse 7, you brood of vipers. Modern terminology, you bunch of rattlesnakes. Who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. God can raise up stones out of the, uh, make children of Abraham out of stones. Some people say, I don't need to be baptized. My church doesn't do it. 
And you're not going to be saved because you belong to a church. You're going to be saved because you follow the Lamb. And you believe in Christ. Amen? God can raise church members up out of stone. Repent. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What does repent mean? Repentance means to be sorry for your sins. Not just lip service. A deep, heartfelt sorrow and anguish for sin. And we have two boys, you know, and, and uh, when they were little, the little one always came out on the short end of things when they played together. I mean, they were three years apart. And he would always get knocked down and hurt. And so we'd tell his big brother, now, you go over there and you tell your brother you're sorry. No, that didn't always go over too well. And sometimes he would just take his time to get over there and get there and mumble something no one on earth could ever understand. That isn't repentance. Repentance is being so sorry that you hate it when you sin. You hate it when you lose your patience. You hate it when you snap at your kids and your wife. You never want to do it again and you say, God, help me never to do it again. That's repentance. Now notice, John the Baptist would not baptize everyone who said, come baptize me, John. He wanted to see a demonstration of repentance before he baptized them. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Again, it doesn't mean that we, that, that we need to be perfect. If you're perfect, you wouldn't need to be baptized. But it does mean that we should be willing to make the changes in our lives that God wants us to make. And then we're ready for baptism. Well then, when should a person be baptized? In Acts, in the book of Acts, the 8th chapter, is one of my favorite baptism stories. In verse 26, an angel of the Lord went to Philip and he told him, go down the desert road. And so he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian. He was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet and the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So Philip ran to the chariot and he heard the man reading from the book of Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I understand, he said, unless somebody explains it to me. Don't be embarrassed if you don't understand everything about the Bible and, and God sends someone to explain it to you. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit and the ministry of the Spirit. And so how can I understand unless somebody explains it to me? So he explained to him about Jesus. He knew about how to live the godly life. He understood those things, but he didn't know Jesus. So he explained to him about who Jesus was. And it tells us right there in verse 35, he told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the Ethiopian said, look, there's the water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And then both Philip and the Ethiopian went down, look, down into the water. Where did they go? Into the water. And Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, he didn't sprinkle a drop or two here and a drop there. They went into the water. He baptized him. They came up out of the water. Now there's something else here. As soon as the Ethiopian was ready to be baptized, he was baptized. He wasn't even at home. He was in a foreign country. He didn't say, well, I want to wait until I go home so that everybody I know can see me. When a person is ready for baptism, they need to be baptized. Don't give the devil another day another moment they're ready it didn't say well my birthday is next month let me wait until my birthday to get baptized now that sounds nice get baptized on your birthday but that's not what baptism is all about baptism is dying to that old life buried in the grave rising up again to live a new life and it's time to do it now when you're ready 
Oh, well, my grandma and grandpa are coming in three more months. I'll be baptized then. It doesn't say wait until grandma and grandpa can come. Baptism is far more serious and urgent than that. He was baptized right then in a foreign country because the Spirit prepared him. He was ready. I'd like for you to follow along with me. In, uh, this time I'm in the book of Acts chapter 16 in one of my favorite stories. It's about Paul. In chapter 16, verse 25. Paul and Silas had been preaching the Word of God and they were put in prison because they were preaching the Word of God. You know, I don't think we can begin to understand or appreciate the, the value of the freedom that we have in this country. Amen? Amen? I mean, we can feel free to preach and teach whatever we want to believe. But there are a lot of countries that aren't that way. And I'm just thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. And here, Paul had been preaching the gospel and Silas together, evangelistic team. In verse 25 of Acts chapter 16, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Now, have you ever thought about that? Here they were in prison, having been beaten, in stocks, locked up, midnight, and what are they doing? They're singing hymns to God. I mean, the rest of the prisoners, can you imagine what they were thinking? What are you guys doing over? Be quiet, it's time to go to sleep. And they're singing hymns to God. Yeah, I really, I love that picture of peace in the middle of adversity, like Paul and Silas. And then in verse 26, it says, Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that all the foundations of the prison were shaken and that once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Man, wouldn't you like to have been there? We see, demonstrated the power of the Holy Spirit. Here they were, prisoners, singing hymns to God, midnight, and in the middle of their captivity, chained in their cell. A great earthquake. All the doors are opened. Now, watch this. In verse 27, the jailer woke up, and he saw the prison doors open, and everybody's chains loose. And so he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He knew if he didn't, somebody else would because it happened on his watch. So here he was about to kill himself. He had himself figured out for dead. Nothing he could do to change that. Now here are all these prisoners. Their doors are open and their chains are loose. See, he figured everybody was gone and he lost all of his prisoners. And so just when he's about to take his life, Paul shouted out in verse 28, he said, don't harm yourself. We're still here. He couldn't believe it. Here they are, still here. Why didn't they run away? The jailer called for the lights and he rushed in and he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what a story. God works in ways that we can't even begin to comprehend and understand. What must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You and your household. And so that night, what time was it? It was after midnight. After midnight that night, they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his household. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds and immediately he and all of his family were baptized. Now that is the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? 
He didn't even want to wait until morning. You see, baptism is urgent. Baptism is important. The moment a person understands that Jesus wants us to follow him into the waters of baptism, to die to that old life, to be buried in the grave with him, to rise up again in order to live a new life, the moment we understand that Jesus wants us to be baptized, right then, baptism is urgent. Baptism is urgent important then there are always people who say well what about me I mean I've been a Christian all my life over 50 years and I've had miracles when I pray God answers I can heal people I can speak in tongues I can have visions God has used me in wonderful ways I've never been immersed are you telling me I need to be immersed I can do miracles I want to show you, I believe, without a doubt, is the most miraculous conversion story that has ever happened. In Acts, the 22nd chapter, verse 6, about noon, I, Saul of Tarsus, came near Damascus. Now, why was Saul of Tarsus going to Damascus? He was going there to persecute and put to death Christians. That's the kind of man Saul of Tarsus was. So I was going to Damascus. I came near Damascus. Suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I like this. I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. You know why that's so special to me? Sometimes I have to confess, I feel like I'm getting persecuted. I feel like the old devil is just attacking me relentlessly. But you know, this tells me that whatever happens to me, Jesus is so close that it's happening to him. He understands me. He understands you. Some of you have told me, oh, man, I've had a terrible day. Oh, I've had a terrible week. I don't know what I'm going to do. Whatever is happening to you is happening to him. He is so close to us that whatever anyone does to us, they're doing it to Jesus. So he understands you. He knows what you need. And he's going to help you see it through. That's encouraging to me. Isn't it encouraging to you? Why do you persecute me? Who are you? I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. Now watch this, verse 10. What shall I do, Lord? Now Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor, is calling Jesus Lord. <laughs> that means something happened to him. That means he was converted. He surrendered his life to Jesus. That's his conversion. What shall I do, Lord? Whatever you want me to do now, not my will, let thy will be done. And the Lord said, go to Damascus, and you'll be ta told all that you have been assigned to do. Now, God has already got something away in mind, something assigned for him to do. And some of you sitting here tonight may not yet have committed your life to Jesus like Saul did. He still has something in mind for you to do. He's got plans for you. So what would you have me do? Go and you'll see all you've been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the bright light had blinded me. Now, folks, that's a miracle, isn't it? I mean, that's a miracle. He saw Jesus and it was so bright that it blinded him. He heard Jesus speak to him. Isn't that a miracle? Are you with me tonight? Amen. Nod your head, raise your hand, say amen or something. It's a miracle. In verse 12, a man named Ananias came to see me as a devout observer of the law, highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and he said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. That's a miracle, isn't it? I've never seen him anyone more miraculously converted than Saul. 
Then he said in verse 14, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know His will and to see the righteous one, that's Jesus, and to hear words from His mouth. And you will be His witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And at that point, Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor, became Paul the apostle. What a conversion. Even had his miraculous call to be an apostle. And so Ananias said, now what are you waiting for? And you'd think he would say, get on out there and do the work of an apostle. That's not what he said. What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away. I don't know anybody that's had more miraculous conversion than Paul. And he still needed to be baptized. When Jesus said, go and be baptized, he meant exactly what he said. In fact, he even told Nicodemus, he said, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he'll not see the kingdom of God. That sounds serious to me. But just in case someone isn't convinced, I want you to go back with me to the Jordan River. And John the Baptist is standing there baptizing people. He looks up and then he sees Jesus, points to him and says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he couldn't believe what he saw next. Because Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, began to take off his outer robe and walk down into the muddy water of the Jordan River. He said, John, baptize me. John said, Jesus, I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes. But Jesus said, John, this must be done in order to fulfill all righteousness. And so, John baptized Jesus, the sinless Son of God, in the muddy waters of the Jordan River. And after Jesus came up out of the water, they heard a voice of God saying, This is my Son, whom I am well pleased. Imagine Jesus going up on the bank of the river, standing there with water dripping from his beard and his robe. And he sees a man standing next to him and he says, Were you baptized? And the man says, No, I wasn't baptized. Jesus says, I was baptized. And the man says, Well, maybe it was necessary for you, but I don't think it's necessary for me. Makes me feel blasphemous just to say that. If it was necessary for the sinless Son of God to walk into the muddy waters of the Jordan River in order to be baptized, how much more should you and I be willing to follow the Lamb? This is Nolan Mosley, and he has decided to follow the Lamb. I really enjoyed getting to know Nolan, and I appreciate his grasp of not only Scripture, but this whole idea of letting God be Lord and Master of his life. And I appreciate that so much, Nolan. And I just covet this awesome opportunity to baptize you today. Nolan, because you love God and you've repented of your sins, and you're trusting Him 
to give you a new heart and a right spirit. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Come on, girl. Wasn't that special? Some of you have never seen a Bible baptism like that before. For some, it's the first time. And I just trust and pray that it will strike a chord in your heart. And that God will use what you have just experienced to put a desire in you to follow the Lamb. Just like Nolan did. And to go down into the waters of baptism before it's too late. Pray with me tonight. Oh, Lord, it's been beautiful. We understand what baptism means. And we've seen it happen. And we can sense the special presence of your spirit right in this place tonight. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll touch each one of our lives. Some of us have already been baptized. Some have and wandered away and perhaps they're thinking about being baptized again. And Lord, there are others that have never taken that beautiful step. And I pray that you'll put a conviction and determination in their hearts to step forward to follow Jesus Christ. Follow the Lamb. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.